Just ahead on a special live edition of American Black Journal, a frank discussion on racial attitudes. We're going to talk about racial bias in law enforcement and education, white privilege, racial discrimination, and much more. Stay right there. You don't want to miss this very important conversation. American Black Journal starts right now. American Black Journal on the road is funded by the Debbie K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. We are on the road coming to you from Focus Hopes Campus in Detroit, and we're tackling a subject that has permeated the nation's headlines recently. We'll explore attitudes toward race and what they say about Detroit and our region. Focus Hope was founded after the 1967 Detroit Rebellion to help overcome racism, poverty, and injustice in the city. We're here today as an example of our vision for One Detroit, where we connect you with stories of Detroit's past, present, and future. Our commitment includes examining the most important issues from Detroit outward. One of those issues is the killings of black men by white police officers in cities across the country. This escalation of lethal force has raised numerous questions, such as whether police have an implicit bias toward black men. My first guest is a nationally recognized expert on neuroscience, decision making, and the law. She lectures to police officers, prosecutors, public defenders, and judges throughout the United States. Please welcome Kimberly Papillon to American Black Journal. Thank you. So it's just coincidence that we're doing this show tonight, but earlier today, of course, we saw uh, the prosecutor in Baltimore dismiss all of the charges against the officers who were involved in the arrest of uh, a guy named Freddie Gray who was uh, detained and then mysteriously, I suppose, turns up with a broken back. Uh, now they're saying no one is essentially responsible for that. And that's the kind of disconnect, I think, uh, that really raises these questions about bias and implicit bias and how we see the value of people's lives based on their skin color. Your research uh, tells us a lot about how that works. And the area in which I teach, which is based on the research of so many um, scientists across the nation and the world, um, I think gives us insight into this area. Um, the uh, most telling components are those studies on a part of the brain called the amygdala. Um, the amygdala is the part of the brain that lights up if on the scans if you see a spider or a snake. Fear. And Big pardon? Fear. Fear. The fear, fear. Uh, threat, anxiety, distrust components of the conversation come into uh, stark relief when we start talking about the amygdala. Now, what they began to do was flash pictures of African American men's faces and Caucasian men's faces and see where people were getting the higher level of amygdala activation. And they found that they were getting a higher level of that spider snake-like activation when people were looking at the African American men's faces. Now to be clear, this is a U.S. phenomenon. This isn't natural behavior, this is learned behavior. Because when we go to other countries, we don't see the same reaction. And this then changes into a number of different phenomena that actually make us very frightened about the future for our country. Um, for instance, that, that same notion of I get a higher level of amygdala activation or somebody might get a higher level of amygdala activation based on their level of implicit or unconscious bias, um, then translates into higher levels as people are looking at individuals with higher levels of Afrocentric facial features. So on a scale of one to nine, um, nine being most Afrocentric, one being least Afrocentric, President Obama might be a three. Um, Shaquille O'Neal might be an eight or a nine. Right. On this scale, and only this scale, Denzel Washington would be a five because on any other scale he would be a ten. I think we have <laughs> agreement about that, certainly. I think um, black and white people uh, would Across agree the on board, that, there's right. unanimity on that. Um, but, but that notwithstanding, what difference does that make when judges begin to make decisions? Right. 
So on that scale of one to nine, as the level of Afrocentricity increases, same crime, same additional offenses, same criminal history, all of those things being equal, you're getting seven to eight more months at every step along the scale of one to nine, meaning that the person at a nine is getting years more than their counterpart of three for the same crimes. Right, right. 400 days more when you just look at skin color um, for the Shaquille O'Neal's versus their Caucasian counterparts, 200 more days for the Denzel's versus their Caucasian counterparts. Yeah. That's significant. Yeah, and, and one of the questions that comes up is where is the point of interdiction? How do we sort of start to say, all right, we're gonna uh, sort of uh, reset the scale, uh, this zero to nine scale, and try to make it uh, a zero to zero scale, right? So that uh, the, 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 the lightest uh, skin colored person with the least Afrocentric uh, features is treated the same as someone who looks like Shaquille O'Neal or, or who looks like me. Your work is in trying to get people to that space. Uh, where do you see the opportunity? The first step in any 12 step program is admit you have a problem. So we have to start there. Which is one of the big problems in America, right? But uh, there's a denial that's based on, I, I don't see color, I don't see race, I don't engage in unfair behavior. Um, but if we are wired somehow, not from birth, but from a very young age taught over and over again that this is, this is how uh, we should perceive people, it's hard to undo that if we don't at least first admit we have a problem. That yeah. step is necessary but not sufficient. Yeah. And to help to get to that space, we have to look at the fact that we have tests out there that show here's an African-American man holding a wallet or a cell phone and another picture of him holding a gun. Same with a Caucasian man, wallet, cell phone, or gun. Say shoot if you see a gun. Say no shoot if you see a wallet or a cell phone right there on the computer screen. If you see a tool versus if you see a weapon. These are easy tests. And we find that people are more likely to say shoot for the African-American man holding the wallet or the cell phone than they are for the Caucasian man holding the gun wow. on the test. Wow. So this is not simply a phenomenon we can say, it's just a few bad apples, let's set it to the side. Yeah. This is a larger problem that's both deep and wide, right. and we need to deal with uh, it. You've also taken a look at age, uh, the way people respond to children of uh, different ethnic backgrounds uh, based on their behavior. Uh, tell us what that, what that shows us. This threat response links to the notion of how we see people as being culpable, responsible, um, and ex indeed dangerous. So if I give you three pictures of children all looking like they're 10 years old, and there are things that make a face look 10 and make a face look 40. Mm -hmm. So um, three 10 year old boys, and the only things I change on those faces are the things that make one appear to be Latino, one to be African American, and one to be Caucasian. And then I tell you the story of a child engaging in a felony behavior, felony type behavior. What they find is that the child that was previously seen as 10, when, the Caucasian child who was previously seen as 10, will now be seen as nine by the police officers who were tested. The African-American child who should have been seen as 10 will be seen as 14, and the Latino child seen as 12. Now flash a picture of an eighth in front of these same respondents. Right. Now the African-American child is seen as 15 or 16, the Caucasian child seen as seven and a half. Which, which again goes to this idea of threat and fear that you think an older child is more likely to be uh, a danger to you. And the idea of imagery, ape has nothing to do with one race or the other. Right. That's just right. something that's out there in the ether that people don't want to talk about. Yeah. Well, if we don't talk about the fact that that image and certain words like savage, urban jungle, wilding also create that increased threat reaction, then we can't fully understand why Tamir Rice can be in a park playing with a toy gun and people don't see a child, they right. see an adult with a real gun. Right. And not just people, but individuals with this um, unconscious bias that we aren't able or willing to talk about. Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you to tell me about one thing you see in the work that you're doing or in the research that gives you hope. Um, if we can start, one thing that I'm doing that I see that's out there um, is the gathering of information. That's critical to the analysis as well We're as training. starting to do that. We think that the crime rate is the arrest rate. And so the reason that African-American men are getting shot at 40% unarmed black men or 40% of the people who are sh shot and killed by police when they're 9% of the population, we think that's the crime rate. But if we look at the number of people who use marijuana, percentage right. of Caucasian people who use marijuana versus the percentage of people in the African-American uh, community who use marijuana, there's higher by 10% in each year for the past 10 years. Mm, yeah. Of, Afri of Caucasian people who use marijuana. But if we look at the arrest rate, it's a different story. Right. The arrest rate is night and day. And people say, we're looking at the crime rate, that's why more people are getting shot. No, you're looking at the arrest rate, which says, 
where the bias is and who's getting patrolled and protected in their right. neighborhoods and communities versus who's actually engaging in activity. And that's where we need to sort of start the conversation with that data to get to a space where that's no longer a problem. Uh, thank you very much thank you. Uh, for being here. Thank you. All right, during discussions about race, we often hear the phrase white privilege. But what does that mean, and is it even a fair term for us to be using? The media partners in the Detroit Journalism Cooperative are taking a closer look at white privilege as they explore racial attitudes in the Detroit area. It's all part of a year-long project looking at whether social and economic conditions have improved much since the 1967 rebellion. Detroit Public Television took the question about white privilege to the streets. White privilege is the fact that you have access to benefits that others may not. We took to the streets, asking people all around the metro Detroit area to share their thoughts about what white privilege is or isn't. I can see how right now white privilege can make, or the term white privilege can make, white people defensive. It's not something we asked for. I didn't ask to be born white. Somebody will ask me, where are you from? And I'll say, I'm from uh, Metro Detroit. We don't get the benefit of the doubt. We don't, we're not treated on a person-by-person -person basis. We could be living next door to a Caucasian serial killer, but I'd be the one that'd be under suspicion. It can often have a negative connotation, and that makes it difficult, I think, for some people to talk about. And they're like, no, really, where? And I'm just like, OK, if I were white, would you ask me this? White privilege. I see it a lot, but it's like, it's not for me to judge them for what they do, you feel me? I believe that there is an attitude of white privilege. White people always mostly have it better. And real, realistic, we're all humans. So it's no, there should be any separation, but unfortunately the way things are set up, um, there's, there's separation throughout the way we live. In 1968, the Kerner Commission saw evidence of that separation and stated in its final findings that our nation was moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Not to be racist, but life is not always a struggle for a white person. Black people always have a struggle. College, job, food, children, jail, officers. People who are underprivileged, they think sometimes they, are, they don't have equal opportunities. Marlo Staudemeyer is the director of the Detroit Historical Society's Detroit 67 Project. We sat down with Marlow to get his take on the varied responses about white privilege. Here in this country, the only thing guaranteed for you, if you work hard, you will get, you will get better honesty. What people don't understand is, is that when you have a level of privilege, your pathway or the level of hard work that you have to put in, for some, is perceived to be different. We're talking about an advantage that people need to recognize that they have. Everyone should have privilege. Everyone should have the same opportunities. I make it a point to look dignified, clean shave, uh, presenting myself using clear English grammar, because again, it could make or break me. Dress in a certain way to appear less than a threat. Let's go back to that. That's a necessity for survival. What I will not do is accept the fact that we're an instant threat because of what we look like. Society has been conditioned and trained to view us as threats because of what we look like and what we wear. On one end, I understand what he's saying. On the other end, I think that if you have privilege, you need to look at this. Or if you don't think you have privilege, you need to look at this. If I have this so-called privilege, then I owe it to myself my family and to black Americans to rally for equality in the way that I raise my family. It's important to raise my child to be compassionate because I went through life not knowing that I was getting more privileges than somebody who was black. Let people understand that it is a difference. I will not say the problem does not exist. The problem exists. There is a solution, and solution lies with yourself. We should start from ourselves and then our family, our neighbors, and then to the society. It can't just be an edict from a government official or a politician or a law officer or even the president. It's a community issue. You know, everyone has to really get involved. In our school books, we can have more about the history of people of color in this country. Discrimination is something that's going to be with us or has been with us for ages. Are we going to change it? No, no. 
The only way we can change something is by educating people. I think people have to have a desire and a will to want to be educated, but it's what you do with the information is most important. Education is a start, but education is just one part of it. You have to be open to dialogue. You have to be open to coming into a room knowing that you're going to feel uncomfortable and facing up to it. I think feeling uncomfortable is okay. All right, joining me now are two people on the front lines of educating the public about racial discrimination and social justice. Please welcome Augustin Arbelou, Executive Director of the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, and Dr. Jay Marks, a student engagement consultant for Oakland Schools. Both of you, Thank welcome you. to American Black Thank Church. You. Thank you for having me. So as we could see there in the, in the film, mm -hmm. one of the, the concepts that we're really struggling with here, I think, is unconscious bias, mm. not the things that, uh, that all of us sort of know we believe and harbor in our hearts, but the things that uh, over time we've developed uh, as, as ways of categorizing people or responding differently mm -hmm. to people. Both of you work uh, in places where you see a lot of that. Uh, I, I right. want you first to start telling us about what you see and just sort of how pervasive it is. Well, to. first of all, it, you can't just talk about unconscious bias or these beliefs that sip in and make, create the situation. You, ask, you also have to look at the, the uh, structures, the institutions right. that, that drive that, it. That, that, that there's a co-creation sure. that goes along. The laws, the policies, uh, the norms uh, that really create the outcome. Yeah. And they're both feeding off each other, and you see it. And so what ends up happening is that the days of explicit biasness, uh, we understand they're sort of leaving us behind. And now we have a different language. It's a code language that is created, and you sort of begin to pick it up. And when we start talking about immigration, what are we really saying? Right, right. What is that code who are, for? Who are we really targeting when we talk about that? So those are things we have to watch for. Yeah. Uh, Jay, you look at this in the, in the context of schools. Uh, the, the very first place uh, that as young people we go and sort of experience some of, uh, some of these things. Uh, talking about privilege, when you are talking, some of your work is with uh, teachers trying to get them to recognize uh, those, those biases that they have. You talk to them about privilege and the way that privilege sort of sneaks into the culture without you really even thinking about it. When we talk about privilege, too, it's privilege, I believe, that most, if not all of us, have it in one area of our identities or not, uh, whether it's a, a part of our racial identity, language identity, religious identity, or the like. For example, I always use myself as an example. It's an African-American male growing up in Detroit. I grew up poor. Um, so being a person of, uh, of poverty, I experienced the levels of oppression via my poverty. Um, today, I guess I'm working to middle class depending on what time of the month. You're a teacher. You know, I'm You're a teacher, right. Class. So, you know, by the time that check clears, I'm poor anyway again. But um, uh, it allows me certain privileges yeah. to uh, live in and make a choice to live in a middle class community. But my racial identity at 48 years old, almost 49 years old, relatively middle class, relatively educated, I still experience oppression. I still experience discrimination, racism, stereotypes, and the like. And what that does is it, it provides a consciousness for me, knowing that there's a part of my identity where I receive privilege, but there's a part of me of my identity where I'm oppressed. What privilege does, though, also, it could be empowering. Our colleague earlier talked about that, that very deep and sacred space of self-reflection. Mm -hmm. And when we allow ourselves to go there and identify our own areas of privilege, we can use that to empower us so that we can use our very own privilege to, to, to really strengthen institutions, to eradicate systems of oppression that take away the privileges from others. So for example, as a middle class person, if my middle class status may, may oppress or discriminate against someone of Somebody poverty, yeah. I can use my middle class privilege to eradicate those systems of oppression. A person who's white and has white privilege, once they go to that deep special space and say, you know what, I have some un unearned merit, I have some unearned credit. I've achieved some things because of the color of my skin. How can I use that to eradicate systems that disenfranchise other people who, who experience discrimination 
because of the color of their skin. Yeah, uh, when you're talking to teachers uh, in, in Oakland County where you teach, uh, that's a place that's got a lot of change going on demographically, yes. right? Yes. Uh, cultural diversity uh, means something really different in Oakland County today yes. than it did five or 10 or certainly than uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Yes. What do you hear from the teachers about the challenge they have not just recognizing the diversity, but then recognizing privilege and bias uh, to be able to, to sort of move it to the side and not have it affect uh, what happens to these kids. But again, it goes back to that, that initial step, again, of self-reflection, identifying, spending that time with myself and to think about the fact that I do have implicit bias. What happens is where this is dangerous if we don't take ourselves there, as toddlers, children begin to categorize things. Food, color, toys, people. And they do that by the color of skin as well. Yeah. By the age of three to five, they begin to develop dispositions and biases about those things that they categorize. Yeah. Food, color, things, toys, people. By the age of nine years old, they've developed a fixed mindset, a bias, that now is very difficult to reverse. By the age of nine years old, that's fourth grade. So we need to be having these conversations at our homes as parents. We need to have these conversations in the classrooms at early ages. Because what I often hear sometimes because teachers are just unaware of the development and the psyche of children, sometimes even the children whom they teach, yeah. they think, well, my children, my kids, they're young, they get along, they don't see race. <laughs> it doesn't matter to them. They don't no, see they color. See How it. often do we hear they, that? They, all the time. Yeah. They see it. They just have not developed a disposition about it at this point. Yeah. They like you. They say, I, I like Jay because Jay likes trucks. I like trucks. Jay likes trucks. Jay's my best friend. Yeah. I have not developed a disposition about Jay because of the color of his skin yet. By the age of five to nine years old, they're developing they it and that. it's starting to stick. Yeah. Uh, Preston, go ahead. I agree with what Jay's saying, but I think we have to also be aware that Oakland County, the suburbs, that's where problems can arise. Mm -hmm. Real problems sure. because sure. police have not been trained. Sure. People of color, blacks uh -huh. driving through a community like Birmingham. Absolutely. They're not accustomed to it. The police stops. The wrong move, an explosion happens. Right. I, I have concerns about that. Yes. Yes. And that kind of sensitivity, we've got to really focus in on. And we've got to train uh, the police, law enforcement, yeah about those situations. So do you get the sense that uh, municipalities in, in Oakland County, governments in Oakland County are aware of this and open to the idea that well, they need to? Well, you know how I do it? it. One of the things that the Michigan Department of Civil Rights does is we have what's called LPACs. Uh -huh. They're advocates in, in law enforcement for community trust that we've, we've, we've sponsored. And we talk, the issues really are not with people who are interfacing with communities of color, uh -huh. the black community, the the Muslim community, the Hispanic community, they tend to be in Detroit. Yes. Let's be real about that. Right. They're in Detroit. But let's talk about Bloomfield Hills, Gross Point, Birmingham, the interaction. We need them at the table, and we have to have some honest dialogue there. And, you know, when you were talking earlier about the, the sort of absence of, or the relative absence of explicit bias and this sort of unconscious bias taking place, it, it seems to me that for the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, that's a tougher thing to deal with uh, from a policy perspective or from an administrative perspective because there's this sense that, well, that might not really exist. Well, that's right. And so what you try to do is you try to bring different groups together and create a safe space to have difficult discussions surrounding race yeah, yeah. where you don't have the media glaring at you. And, and given what's happened in the last three weeks, you can sort of emote. Yeah. All sides can talk emote about the and talk that, about what's that going might, on. That might scare you that you That's might right. not want to say. They, that, uh, those publicly. are the difficult conversations, but we have to do it. But we have to do it and we have to find space and you have to not pick up your material and then yeah. walk out. Yeah. You have to stay through it and, and really listen. And little by little, when you create those, uh, that dialogue and that space, now you're creating relationships. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jay, we've got about a minute left. Uh, I asked Kimberly Pepe on this uh, question too. I want to ask you, especially because you work in the schools, what's the thing you see that gives you hope that this is, moved, this is moving in the right direction? One, our children. I do a lot of work with our children. There are student social justice clubs, diversity clubs for students from middle school to high school sprouting up all over the county. And they're talking, they're engaging. Matter of fact, folks, they're waiting on us. 
They're waiting on adults in their lives, their parents and the teachers to join to them in the conversation. In to engage because they're ready. They're doing things. Another thing that gives me hope is colleagues. There's growing interest in the work. The work that I facilitate with educators in the county is around race, ethnicity, culture, diversity, equity, and social justice. People are interested in work. They're interested in having conversations. But the conversations aren't enough. We need to enact. There needs to be, the conversation needs to be followed by something. Each and every one of us has something that we can contribute. And if we recognize an injustice, there's something that each and every one of us can do. Right? We can't sit in silence and be bystanders. So our children give me hope. The conversations that I have on an intimate level, personal level, but as, as a whole group level, those, those things give me hope. Yeah. And, and, and I know that there are people who are passionate about but really still, wanting to do some things. There's still, of course, a lot of work to do. A lot of work Thank to do. you both for being here tonight. And thank you, Steve. Thank you for having yeah. me. We want to take a moment to thank our partners for making tonight's show possible. It's all a part of our ongoing coverage of the Detroit Journalism Cooperatives Project called The Intersection. Special thanks to the funders for their support. We're going to go off the air right now uh, to make way for PBS coverage of the Democratic National Convention. That's important too. But our conversation is far from over. We're going to continue online at AmericanBlackJournal.org. Coming up next, data expert Kurt Metzger reveals some eye-opening survey results about race relations in the Detroit area. We're going to see you online in just a few minutes. American Black Journal on the Road is funded by the Debbie K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Hello and welcome back to this special live edition of American Black Journal. What do residents think about the status of race relations in the Metro Detroit area? The Detroit Journalism Cooperative wanted to find out. So with funding from the Knight Foundation, the DJC was able to conduct a comprehensive poll of 600 people. To share some of the results is Kirk Metzger. He's the founder of Data Driven Detroit and the mayor of Pleasant Ridge. Uh, thanks for being here, Kirk. My pleasure, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so talk yeah. about what you learned in this survey about uh, the way people think about race relations, how important they think it is, and what they think we ought to be doing about it. Well, I think one of the, you know, you were asking the, the previous um, interviewees about the good news. Yeah. I think the, the good news is that some of the, the opinions are very much similar across white and African American, and, mm -hmm. and there is some small population of other, which is a mix. Yeah. Um, but the idea that, that race relations and the idea of discussing race relations is very important. It's, it's, it's one of the major issues that people are addressing. They feel that it is important to talk about it, yeah. that we need to be addressing it. Obviously, African Americans think it's a little more important than whites do. I think African Americans in this area have also seen over the years, they feel that race relations have diminished somewhat yeah so they they're not as as positive right I mean I, there's right. a gap between right. what direction people think things are headed in right. whites tend to think we're headed in the right direction African Americans less likely to believe that. and I think we've seen that nationally I mean 
with Obama's, when Obama gets elected, then everybody feels race relations, everything's fine, right? right? And whites have felt that things, you know, what else do you want, right? Yeah. So, yeah. and so we see a little bit of that, but it's, it's closer in this region than I see in some of the national polls, yeah. Yeah. which is good news. Right. Um, but also there's questions, so, okay, here's the, our race yeah, relations. Yeah, we've got a graphic up on the screen. Generally good, generally bad. Um, and you see that, that whites feel it's generally good, a little bit higher rate. Um, but as I said, what has happened is you see that African Americans are seeing the last 10 years when asked about how, how they changed over the last 10 years, African Americans have seen them kind of gotten worse yeah. and whites have seen them got better. So there is that. Uh, what about the, the level of dialogue uh, that, that's necessary to sort of get past that? What do whites and blacks think about that dialogue? I, I hear from a lot of white people uh, that they're tired of talking about race and that they don't feel like uh, it's something they need to address. African Americans uh, are more eager to try right. to to try to get to dialogue because I think they think it is a pathway to change. Well, I, I tend to agree with African Americans that it needs to be that we need to talk about. It. It's easy to say, well, we've talked about it enough. Yeah. Just like um, everything is fine, um, but it's you know it's it's p similar to people misunderstanding white privilege as you as you talk about. It. Yeah. You know, they don't recognize that, so they think everything is fine. We don't have to talk about it. We've talked about it forever. We've gone to our diversity seminars. We feel good. You know, we've, we've done the, the work, um, but I think the discussions, the discussions have to be there. Yeah, yeah. What, what are some of the other things that we learned in the, the survey? Well, there was also, you know, the question of is it a major, is, is uh, race relations, discussions around race relations, is it is a major concern, much of a concern. And so you can see African Americans, again, the good news is everybody thinks it's a concern. Uh -huh. Um, there was something called major versus significant, and African Americans tend to put it a little bit higher on the scale. But the good news is that everybody feels it's an issue that needs to be talked about. Um, the other question that was asked was, what are the major issues? And I think what we've seen with the, the movement of African Americans out of Detroit over the last 10, 15 years, you talked about the changing in Oakland County, well, Macomb County has seen tremendous change. Uh, absolutely. And out Wayne County. But the idea is that everybody is looking for the same thing. Yeah. Whether you're white, African American, Latino, Middle Eastern, whatever, you're looking for education, good education, good mm -hmm. school systems. You're looking for safety. Right. You're looking for jobs. Um, we didn't get. We didn't ask about transportation, job opportunity. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to have transportation as well. <laughs> We're um, working on that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and while whites think roads are a little more important than race relations, yeah. race relations is at least like the number four in yeah. terms of the group. So. Uh, one of the interesting things I thought of when I saw this uh, graphic that's on the screen now mm -hmm. is. Uh, the, these issues are teased out from race in this survey, but in, a, in many ways, they become proxies for race. So right. education, uh, yep. school districts, what school district am I gonna choose? How do I wanna pay for schools? That's, uh, That's right. overlaid with, uh, with race and racial right. tensions. Uh, crime, of course, uh, significant racial components Definitely. in the way people Definitely. see that issue and make uh, decisions. And then, of course, jobs right. uh, and the economy uh, have deep racial uh, uh, roots. Right. Uh, so really, these are all sort of swirled together, I think, in, in, in the way that, that they manifest themselves and perhaps in the way we ought to deal with them. Right. They are, and we, you know, we talked about it not with you, but with uh, somebody else at the station, uh -huh. about the issue of class also kind of plays into Absolutely. This. race and class. And, mm -hmm. and we're not going to talk about that now, but that's something that needs to be talked about. But it's also, you talked <coughs> about changes in the dynamics in Oakland County. When you talk about education, crime, and you talk about the mixing, as we see demographic change and we see African Americans moving into the suburbs. And you start seeing the changes in school systems. Yeah. We talked about that before. You yeah. start to see those tipping points. And how does that play out in terms of education and what people think of quality education, what people think of crime? Um, you know, do they think all of a sudden the code words that we start using that it's becoming a little more dangerous or it's becoming the schools are losing their quality, things are going down, it's becoming much more uh, difficult to get a good education. I think these are issues that we need to talk about, and, yeah. and a lot of it is that combination of right, the two. Right, right. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you are the mayor of Pleasant Ridge, yes. uh, which is a community right. in South Oakland County, right. shares a school district right. uh, with Ferndale, Ferndale. Uh, which is right on the border with Detroit and has experienced right. a uh, significant demographic change, 
Uh, talk about how these issues look from that seat. I don't know that I've ever asked you that. You're right, it's, fairly new to the job. It's an interesting, <laughs> yes. And, and uh, one of the, I just want you to know, one of the jobs of a Pleasant Ridge mayor is to sit at the pool and get a tan and watch what's going on in the. <laughs> just just want that. you to know, that's, that's, that was one of the job descriptions. And that's why I went after it. You're doing that really uh, well. I'm doing right? it really well. The rest of it, not so well, but that's, that I'm doing really well. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's always been, I've been in, lived in Ferndale and lived in Pleasant Ridge and our kids went to Ferndale schools and we've watched the dynamics with schools of choice. Yeah. The, the, the Ferndale school system, the population within the Ferndale school district is about 25% African American. Uh -huh. The school system is 75% African American. And you start to have the dynamics, you have some, you have Royal Oak Township, you have some Oak Park, you have Pleasant Ridge and you yeah. have Ferndale. Right. Very different, really different racial dynamics. Yeah. And it was kind of the way by closing schools, you start getting the entire district going to one school. Mm -hmm. It wasn't kind of segmented off. And so there are a lot of discussions around it so it becomes socioeconomic, yeah. it becomes issues of am I really you know, do I see that the quality of education is going down? Do yeah. I and Pleasant Ridge tends to while we have a lot of supporters for Ferndale schools, we certainly vote for um, all the, the education bond issues yeah. and things like that. But there are a lot of parents that go to Berkeley, Royal Oak. Yeah, they opt out. Yeah, yeah. opt out. All so right. it's, a, it's a real di discussion. So. Thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. All Thank right. you. Uh, we're coming to you live tonight from the campus of Focus Hope. We're in the Center for Advanced Technologies, which is one of the facilities where Focus Hope students can advance their education and their career goals. As you'll see in this next video, Focus Hope has numerous programs designed to bridge the racial divide here in Southeast Michigan. Focus Hope's mission is to overcome racism, poverty, and injustice. And we do that in a variety of ways. The Workforce Development Programs, Hope Village Initiative, the Food Commodity Program, and the Early Childhood Initiatives. We offer programs in manufacturing as well as information technology. It's not just about delivering a a class is not just about instructing or providing skills, it's really about changing a mentality of a population of people who have been left behind. Um, it just kind of gave me a uh, firm sense of uh, discipline when it came, comes down to studying and setting a goal. Everything was there for me, I had to go get it now. Joining me now is the CEO of Focus Hope, William Jones, along with Shirley Stancato, who is the president and CEO of NUA Detroit, which also works to eliminate racial disparities. Welcome both of you to thank American you. Black Journal. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we should note that both of your organizations founded in 1967 after uh, the unrest, the rebellion here in Detroit to, to try to deal with the, the racial disparities that we have. Uh, talk about just, I'm curious from both of you, 50, we're coming up on 50 years mm -hmm. later, how much further are we down that road? William, I'll start with you. Well, um, Focus Hope actually came together on March 8th, 1968. It's it sort of right, the, the birth date of it, yeah. but the, the, the impetus behind it was most definitely the rebellion of 1967. Relative to how far we've come along, I think we've, we've made tremendous strides in terms of institutional racism, the legislated racism, but I'm not certain that we've made as much of a progress as we'd like to believe we have in terms of the unconscious biases, the way people react to one another sure. in our society. Yeah, yeah, Shirley? So we started in 1967. As a matter of fact, when I talk about how New Detroit started, I say a week after the civil disturbance or the riot or the rebellion based upon your perspective. Your name, right? Uh, right. <laughs> the, um, the governor, Governor Romney, uh, called up Mayor Kavanaugh and said, we didn't see this coming what should we do? They tapped Joe Hudson, who was family was the head of the Hudson's department store, and he, by the way, was 32 years old, and he pulled together a group of individuals, originally called the New Detroit Committee, to begin to look not just at what happened, but the reasons behind what happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, William, here at Focus Hope, you guys are deeply involved in uh, job training, and not just job training in the sense of, uh, well, I'll teach you to do something, and good luck, 
out in the world trying to find work, sure. uh, but training people for specific jobs that, the, the, that exist. Uh, connect that to the discussion about race and racism, jobs mm -hmm. and, and, and race. What, what, what do they have to do with each other? Well, they've got, they've got quite a bit to do to, with each other. Uh, I, I didn't grow up in Detroit. I grew up in Hampton, Virginia. Uh -huh. And ra race relations there were a lot different than my perception of what existed here in Detroit at uh -huh. that time. But you always had a sense that folks were consigned to a certain tier of jobs unless your parents made a committed effort to make certain that you got the education, the opportunities, that you knew that you could be a doctor, a lawyer, somebody else that, that, that wasn't normally made available to you. And in our community in Virginia, we had, uh, I would say, a uh, much more egalitarian approach to it. The deacon in your church might also be the janitor at your school. Mm -hmm. right. We were taught to respect everybody. I'm not certain. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I am certain that there wasn't always propagated elsewhere. You know. And here at Focus Hope, even today, as we train people for jobs, as we try to bring in economic opportunity, we want to make certain that they're not consigned to certain types of jobs. Simply because the educational system might have failed you, or the color of your skin, or you may not have had this opportunity, that opportunity, we think that we can intercept people at different points in their lives and certainly promote with them the idea that they can succeed at something much, much higher. Yeah, yeah, and it's not, it's not easy to maintain this kind of institution, this kind of program in the current climate, the current political climate, right? Where uh, the idea of this kind of long-term investment in human right. capital is a really tough sell. It's, it's a very, very tough sell. Everybody wants an instant response. Well, first place, a lot of people don't recognize that these things need to be done. Sure. You know, much the same way that as, as, as folks look at uh, Detroit public schools as an example, it always pops into my mind. The single most important thing that they have to do in any of the school systems is educate the kids properly. Right. Not just for today's jobs, tomorrow's jobs. This, after that, you can start to talk about, do we balance the budget and the other things. But if you haven't taken care of the educational needs and the aspirations of the children, damn the budget. Yeah, right. What are you okay, doing? I'm sorry. I'm, you know. oh. That's why we had you on. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Shirley, you guys uh, have the, uh, a big 50th anniversary coming up next year uh, yeah. along with the, the rebellion or the riots mm -hmm. or the disturbance. Uh, and you guys are, are taking uh, a tack there that really is going to try to get people engaged in this space where we're thinking about race differently than we do now or than we have for the last 50 years. I believe that New Detroit was created really to uh, provide racial healing in one way or another. Um, in this community and so our 50th anniversary is next year and we really for the last 18 months have been embarking on a, uh, a, a project that we're going to present, uh, we're going to announce it real soon, but it's, we're calling it our 50th anniversary uh, racial healing project. Uh -huh. And so what we're going to do is we're working with organizations that are part of New Detroit, but the key pieces of the uh, project are to look at your own genealogy. We're going to have genealogists work with you to, to help you do your own as opposed to having someone hand it to you as we see in some of the television <laughs> programs. But to do your own genealogy and then historians will help to trace that genealogy over 150 to 200 years looking at the, the, the markers that about around race, what was happening racially in this country uh, for the 150 and 200 years. And then uh, we're going to do a DNA testing uh, using the National Geographic's Genome Project to have people look at DNA. And, and the, I, not the idea is, but I think we all know that race is a social construct. Oftentimes I say racism created race, mm -hmm. that there's no biological, there's no gene for race. And so we're gonna have people look at that, look at the genealogy, and then look at the DNA. And we're asking them to have conversations either with their, um, with their colleagues, or community, the churches, but your major conversations to talk about that. So think about it, um, Stephen, when you do yours, and, um, <laughs> and, and you get to have that discussion perhaps right. with another editor from another newspaper <laughs> in, in, in the city to talk about sort of where you come, everybody came from Africa, and what are the other pieces of that? To look at race as something made up, and we're fighting about it every day in every way across the world, yeah. really. And so when you look at the fact that it really is made up by people who wanted to continue to separate us, I think that's another place for us to start to begin to do healing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, New Detroit is also uh, deeply involved in the discussion about education here in Detroit. Uh, we keep, 
it seems to me we just keep cheap chasing our tail here, right? We're not, we never get anywhere uh, forward. I can't, I can't believe it because we've been, New Detroit from its origins realized that education was one of the pieces of the puzzle that needed to happen, needed to occur to close the gap. And so every CEO, president and CEO of New Detroit has worked on education in a way. We just spent the last 18 months as a part of the Coalition for Detroit School Children mm -hmm. focused on education and changing and we really had gone pretty far. We were excited that we actually had the Senate to say yes to the recommendations. And then it went to the House and we know what happened there. But it is something that we really have to continue to do. This country is falling further and further behind the rest of the world. The state of Michigan really is about 47th out of 50 when it comes to educating kids. It's not just Detroit. We've got to change the way we fund schools. We've got to change what happens in the classroom. So uh, still a lot of work to do. We're not looking at, at, looking at it really as a defeat. We made some strides, but we still have a lot of work to do, and we have to keep yeah. our eyes on the prize. Yeah. We've got about a minute left. Uh, I ask almost everyone else this question. One thing that gives you hope? Um, <clears throat> like the previous speakers, the young people. Yeah. Okay. And you see uh, them here every day. Uh, right? We see them here every day. Uh, unfortunately, too many of the ones that we see are coming from extraordinarily difficult circumstances. Sure. But then there are others who are here who just inspire you. We've got a freedom school down at the Center for Children just a few steps away from here, and it's amazing. It is amazing to see the enthusiasm, the affection, the love, the energy, the desire to learn on parts of these young folks. Right. In a, in a school where uh, the children are people that a lot of folks would just write off because of where they're from. Except we don't write them You don't. We don't write them all. Right, right, right. 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 Uh, go ahead, Shirley. A uh, couple things. First of all, the fact that uh, what gives me hope is the fact that the business community is still at the table. A lot of major corporations move their headquarters away, but the next generation has stepped in, and that c continues to keep me excited. And the other thing really is the young people have to say that. But what I tell people all the time is that young people come to us and they say, you know what? My parents, our parents are hypocrites because they say one thing and they <laughs> and do they another. Do They're else. watching what you do, not what you say. And so what they want is a safe place to have conversations with kids who don't look like them so that they can really get to know them and then to move forward. So yeah. I'm excited about that. All right. Thanks both of you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, coming up next, we'll take questions from our audience. But first, here's a look at some important moments in Detroit's black history. I'm Ken Coleman with a look back at African-American life in Detroit. This week in 1973, Inner Visions by Stevie Wonder was released on Motown Records. In golden lady, golden lady, I'd like to go there. Golden lady, golden lady, I'd like to go there. In 1976, City Council approved a resolution to change 12th Street to Rosa Parks Boulevard. And in 1984, Bishop P.A. Brooks was elected to serve as a Church of God and Christ official. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history, taken from the book On This Day, African American Life in Detroit. I'm joined now by William Jones, Kimberly Papillon, and Augustin Arbalu. We're ready to hear from our audience members. First question, go ahead. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, I'm a retired police captain, and my question is for you since you're a journalist. Uh -huh. One of the ways that I see that uh, we can reduce this uh, negativity between um, the police and the black community is accountability. And one of the, uh, besides the police department being accountable, and investigating itself, which, you know, that can be <laughs> yeah, you never know how negative or positive. Sure. But the but the the source that should be checking and and uh, verifying uh, that what they are doing is correct and fair is the press. Mm -hmm. And from what I see, the press is is accepting what the police department is telling them at face value and not digging deeper. Let me give you an example. Okay. This uh, latest shooting in my in North Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw the uh, news reports, and it said that the officer had one um, previous internal affairs investigation, and he was exonerated. Well. Uh, knowing that that could be deeper, so I went on to their site, the police site, to investigate, mm -hmm. and they had his whole file there. 
Well, right within the file, you could read the internal affairs case, and he should not have been exonerated. Yeah, yeah. So either the journalist didn't read this that I read here in Michigan, or they read it and they didn't care or didn't understand it. Sure. So uh, how do we deal with that? Well, so, uh, I mean, I can't speak for any other journalist, obviously. Uh, I can speak for myself and for the Detroit Free Press uh, and talk to you about how much time we spend digging through what police do and do not do. Uh, the the uh, consent decree that was uh, agreed to between the Justice Department and the Detroit Police Department that had us under federal supervision for a decade started with a series of news stories in the Detroit Free Press about the tactics that uh, police here were using in terms of the dragnetting that was going on, uh, the rough tactics with the uh, suspects. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I would say it's a priority uh, for us to be able to try to do those things. Now, of course, we're smaller than we used to be. Uh, the, t the business is tougher than it used to be. So the challenges to us are, are greater. But there's no question, and certainly as the editorial page editor and as a columnist, uh, my bias is toward accountability for the police. I spend a lot of my time thinking and writing about how we can hold police more accountable for their behavior, not less. It doesn't mean that uh, there are other journalists who are not doing as much or who may be not as well trained in, in trying to ferret that out. But uh, I think locally we're, we're not doing a horrible job with that. Next question. I'll offer this question to anyone on the panel. I have a friend who mentored a white woman, suburban, successful, mentored two uh, African-American girls for nine years, inner city girls. Next year, they're going to graduate from high school. Uh, rare opportunity for her to get to know them and their family and vice versa. How significant could that type of work on a large scale uh, be in terms of a lot of the issues we're talking about, education as well as racial um, unity, uh, how big of an impact could it make if, you know, here, here we are at Focus Hope, and it was Father Cunningham and Eleanor Jositis who came into the community and said, we're not going to talk about it, we're going to do something about it. What if everybody said, I'm going to make a commitment of two hours a week to do something about it? William, I'll let you, or whoever, whoever. Oh. jump in. I'll give it a try. Um, uh, I think it's wonderful that people get out there in various communities and take the time to work with our youth. I think that's great on one hand. On the other hand, um, African American and Latino children shouldn't be used as um, the tools by which somebody learns how to not be biased anymore so that they are the exposure that adults get um, so that they can um, overcome their implicit biases. I'll give you an example, for instance. Um, we want to make sure that people who have gotten over their biases, and there are meaningful ways to do that, then come to the table and begin to interact. But if we have someone who holds significant bias, it affects the brain of the young person. Um, it affects their disease rate over time when they're dealing with having to um, listen to microaggressions, someone who may come up to you and you're thinking to yourself, I think I'm pretty well spoken and they're shocked that you're articulate. <laughs> Little things that happen over and over again. Um, additionally, when we have our young children in a classroom setting, we find significant differences in their brain reactions when they're in a place where people don't believe they can do well. The part of their brain that's about how smart they are turns right on and they master topics. The part of their brain that then allows them to use that mastery on a test that's going to happen a week later literally turns off in the face of a biased instructor that's in front of them. So it's important that we don't create interaction for the sake of interaction, exposure so to speak, for the sake of exposure at the expense of the children of color, but instead that we get an adult population that gets rid of their implicit biases and then come to the floor so that they can interact, interact with the children uh, in a way that's meaningful and healthy for everyone. Yeah. Uh, question over here. Uh, yes. Um, uh, given the components of education and job opportunity as being key issues nationwide with African Americans and other minority groups. Uh, Father Cunningham used to always talk about thinking outside of the box. What would be, what would solve Detroit's education system problem if the education system was driven by industry, research, and development? In other words, the automotive industry, which is very prevalent here in the city of Detroit. What would happen if they received a tax break to actually take over the education system along with other industries and uh, employ people, train them from the cradle 
all the way through college, have the teachers come out of the, uh, uh, the different industries and drive our schools toward okay. job opportunities okay. mm -hmm. and uh, uh, economic prowess. That, uh, is that a solution we ought to be talking about, William? Well, <coughs> industry does have a, uh, an investment to make, a much greater investment to make in terms of education, making sure that the resources are there. Um, I'm not certain that I would ascribe to a notion that industry should come out and just drive it because industry does have its own bias towards making a profit, <laughs> towards satisfying its goals in the short term and the near term. I am much more interested in education that's going to prepare kids for the jobs that we don't even know about yet, okay, for the opportunities that we don't even know about, to take our imagination much further than it is right now. But I would also defer to educators to, to speak to that particular issue. I think that education, one is to remember our Constitution is, provides for that our children are to be educated. It's an entitlement provision. The question is, and the challenge too often is that the politics gets in the way, that we do not have the honest discussion. And then we have another challenge, and, and that is, look at our, uh, our, our geographic makeup. And when we look at our geographic makeup, we see these disparate impacts throughout southeastern Michigan. And so one of the issues might be that we have to revisit the school district concept to make it more regional so we can think more uh, outside the box. Yeah. Uh, I think this is going to end up being our last question, but we'll see if we can so, get one in after uh, this Just too. a Go ahead. question um, and a quick comment. Um, how do we change laws that are implemented that allow people to be biased? Um, my son was walking down the street and was stopped by a police officer just for nothing in the middle of the night. And when the police aggressively stopped, and then when the police officer recognized it was my son, it was a police officer that knew him. I was like, oh, hey, Carlos, man, how you doing? This and that, what you doing? Hey, man, have a safe evening. Let, evening, let him go. But my son called me, was happy about the officer, seeing an officer, but then later on, my thought was, what if he wasn't an officer that knew you? Yeah, that's yeah. right. That, 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 is a, that is a continuous problem. There's no doubt that we have racial profiling that goes on, and that, it goes back to what Kimberly is talking about. We have to have some really honest dialogue. It's, we have to move from the fact that we have these uh, unconscious biasness and be conscious about it and, that, and then act deliberately. And, and that's, that's a long process. And it requires people like you, people like the police, sitting down in a safe space and having these conversations. What causes this police officer to do what he did. And we have to go beyond go dialogue, of course, yeah. as well. Dialogue is important. I think Absolutely. we all agree that that's the first step. If we stop at the talking, then nothing changes. So that's yes, right. we've got to go to laws. We've got to go to the multiple interventions that are out there that say we can change people's level of bias. But how do you get people to vote for laws like that? Well, it's back to the neuroscience um, when I look at it. Um, when you see someone who's getting hurt, you feel their pain. It's called cortical spinal inhibition. You actually have a sensation in your body, pain empathy sensation when you see someone getting hurt. Mm -hmm. When you see someone getting hurt who you don't care about or who you don't relate to, you don't have that same sensation in your body. Literally, if I showed you a film of someone being poked right here with a hypodermic needle and that hand did not look as much like yours, then you would have a different level of sensation based on your level of implicit or unconscious bias. So that will vary demographic group to demographic group, how much empathy you feel for somebody else. If I don't feel empathy for your son, I'm not going to vote to enact legislation that's going to take care of your son. If I don't think that I need to be as concerned about your son as I am about the people in my home, then I'm not going to have that relationship and I'm going to dehumanize your son and I won't even know that I'm doing it. And I'll get to the polls and the next thing I will say to you is, I don't have bias, I voted for President Obama. <laughs> and that will be the end of the conversation. Can I, can I just say one yeah, thing from a department, got about a minute, got about a a department of Civil Rights perspective? If your child gets stopped, and they shouldn't have been stopped, I want you to file a complaint. Okay. You need to I want you to file a complaint with the Department of Civil Rights so we can investigate. Yeah, well, you have a yeah and before you get to that point, vote, vote, and if you can vote again, do so. <laughs> Don't tell them that. I'm serious. <laughs> no, no, no. no well, yeah, I mean, this, 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 this is very, very important. It's very important that you ask questions 
of people who seek to earn your trust and to seek to have you do things on their behalf. How do you feel about this, that, and the other thing? I've got three sons. Okay. We, we gotta, we gotta okay, reiterate. Sorry. And this is not Chicago, so we only sons. vote once. <laughs> 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 That's all the time we have tonight, but we will be revisiting this issue, of course, on future episodes of American Black Journal, so be sure to watch on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. on WTVS Detroit Public Television. Thank you to Focus Hope and to our audience tonight. We will see you next time.